Welcome once again to the course Life of Christ. Now we're in class 33 and moving on to a section in John today, especially talking about uh, what is salvation like in the Gospel of John. So let's begin by going to chapter 3, John 3. <clears throat> we'll read a, a large part of the chapter. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they were old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. And we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. But everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. Now, if you think about the topic of salvation in uh, John and also in the rest of the New Testament, and really the whole attitude of God toward the world, you ask, uh, how does God feel about the world? Uh, is it an attitude of love, compassion, mercy, wanting to help, or is it an attitude of punishment, criticism, finding faults, uh, wanting to condemn? And I think if you look overall at the story of God in the Bible, it's really God is love. And yet sometimes people misunderstand that. When you come to the topic of salvation, especially in the New Testament, um, sometimes we get confused about how to define that, or sometimes uh, what are the steps to salvation, or sometimes we even ask the wrong question. For example, many times we'll ask people, uh, in what church were you baptized? Uh, because if they weren't baptized in our particular church, then maybe we suspect that their salvation may not be complete or valid uh, the way they were baptized. 
I think it's better perhaps uh, to look at the whole picture and ask uh, questions like, uh, what did you do or say <clears throat> or believe when uh, you became a Christian? Because that's a little bit more general question. It doesn't depend so much on a certain church or a certain location, but it depends on what the Bible actually teaches about what's necessary for salvation. Now, um, if you look uh, in the Bible uh, <clears throat> and uh, you look at uh, how one comes to faith, how one is saved, um, you can answer this question. You probably all uh, know all of the answers <laughs> to this question. Uh, we would have people say, well, you know, first of all, you have to find out about it. You have to hear the gospel, first of all. Uh, you also have to believe what you hear. And uh, believing is very important in the book of John and in the book of Acts in particular. Uh, then if you hear it and you believe it, then that's going to imply some kind of change. And so you need to repent. Um, although this word repent is really not much mentioned in John at all. Uh, nor Romans or other New Testament books. It's really not mentioned as much as we think it might be. Um, and then if you repent, then there's an element of which you are sharing publicly uh, what you believe and what you want to repent of and how you want to change. And so you confess publicly to others uh, about this change and this decision that you're making. And then uh, in the Bible, you see numerous examples of people then following up with baptism uh, to, you know, be immersed in water, to symbolize their, their death uh, to their old life, to uh, symbolize how they're united with Christ and his death, burial, and then resurrection, coming out of the water to begin a new life. And then uh, we also add <clears throat> many times, uh, then we have to remain faithful to the Lord. It's not enough just to get wet or just enough to change for one day, but we need to show a changed life. And Obviously, that process takes the whole lifetime. It's uh, sanctification, uh, one word the Bible uses for it, uh, and it's not really usually very immediate, and it's not usually very easy. Uh, it's a process of a whole life. Now, if I were asking you to write down on a sheet of paper different scriptures uh, that teach these things, I'm certain that you could come up with a great list of scriptures. Uh, and if you look at that list and you take any one of those scriptures, you'll notice that you won't find one single scripture that includes all of those steps. So I had like, you know, six different steps here. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the steps of salvation, the way of salvation. But there's actually no one passage that includes all six. In fact, you're doing well if you can get a passage that includes three out of the six. And so we look at uh, how we study sometimes the Bible and how we present the matter of salvation and how people are to be saved. And unless we're careful, uh, we can give an incomplete or even incorrect answer for what the Bible teaches about how to be saved. Uh, for example, if you go to a church of Christ, uh, you'll find a great emphasis on Acts chapter 2, especially verse 38. They'll say, you know, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you have at least two of the, the six, repent and be baptized, uh, and that's great. And so the Church of Christ is traditionally focused on that one. Uh, if you look at the Pentecostals, they might go to Romans 9, or Romans 10, excuse me, verse 9, and say, uh, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, then you're saved. And, and they put the emphasis on the confessing and the believing in the heart. Uh, and there's no mention of baptism in that passage. And so you can take every one of the passages where you, you see these six different aspects of salvation, uh, and you won't find anyone that contains all six. And so instead of trying to hang our hat on just one verse, we have to be careful and say, let's look at what the whole Bible teaches about salvation, particularly uh, the New Testament, although the Old Testament points to the New Testament and at Jesus. And so it's part of the overall story. Uh, so if we do that, uh, then we could say perhaps um, that we have uh, a package deal. Uh, I've compared it before to making a cake. 
uh, where in order to make the cake, you have to have all the ingredients, even though you might like some ingredients more than others. So you might enjoy the taste of sugar, for example, when you make a cake. But if it's only sugar, then it's not a cake. It's just, you know, a pound of sugar. Uh, and so you have to have all the elements and have to be mixed up in the right way in order to produce the cake. I think if we could take that overall view, it's a more biblical view and a healthier view as well. It makes more sense. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in worrying about the order of what order the steps happen in. And there's some disagreement about do we you know, believe and then get baptized before we're saved or are we saved and then we get baptized as a sign and I would say, look, all of the steps are in the New Testament. Uh, why would we want to eliminate any step? And if we do want to eliminate a step, then my question would be, what's going on with that? You know, why would you want to not obey one of the steps that the Bible talks about as important in coming to know Jesus and being saved? And so I would recommend that we try to study the entire New Testament uh, and really get to the core of, you know, what's what's important in salvation and how to be saved, and then do all of it uh, and share that. And then when people come to us from other places and we don't know if they're a Christian or not, then it's a natural question to say, well, how do you understand what the New Testament teaches about being saved? Uh, what of that have you done? And instead of saying, what group are you from again? Or, you know, what church were you baptized in? We just say, you know, how, how do you understand the Bible teachings, the Bible's teaching about being saved? Think it's a better question overall. Uh, I want to also specify um, the process in John, since we're uh, reading part of John today, uh, for how one comes to Christ. And if you go through all of John and you write down the different steps or the different aspects of one coming to a relationship with Christ, it's a little bit different maybe than we've ever thought about before, and it, it produces perhaps a different focus when we look at what John's overall teaching about salvation is, how one comes to Christ. If you go, for example, um, to John 3, 16, uh, you see that the work begins with God. Uh, it doesn't begin with man. It's not our idea. It's not within our power. Uh, we didn't even think about it. God thought about it first and laid down the conditions and, and the methods for people to come to know him. And so, it says that, you know, God loved the world. That was a starting point. Before we even existed, before we could do anything or think anything, it says God started. God loved the world, first of all. And then if you go to John 5, uh, verses 17 through 19, part of what we mentioned the other day when we were studying the lame man in John 5, it says the Father is always working, and I too am working. And so God initiates the work. He loves the world. And then he initiates uh, everything that he wants to do. Every project, every relationship, he's the one that starts it. And then John 6, 65 says that no one can come to Christ unless given to uh, God by the Father. And so that's an interesting idea. We don't think about it in those terms that, that God is going to make it possible for people to come to him. You would think that would be automatic. But God chooses uh, to invite people, and he makes it possible for them to come to Christ. And so God helps that process. And then in John 6, 44, it says that the Father draws them to Christ, and they come. So he makes it possible, and then he exerts an attraction. He draws them to Christ, uh, and they come. And then in John 5, 37, it talks about how the Father testifies about Jesus. In other words, he's begun the work. Uh, he wants the relationship. Uh, he draws them to Christ. And when they get close to Christ, then he testifies about who Christ is and what Christ does. And then it also adds in 6, 45, that the Father teaches them. The Father teaches them. This is a quote out of Isaiah uh, 54. Uh, and they learn from him. Uh, also in John 14, just kind of a cross-reference, talks about how God sends the Spirit uh, to teach all the things about Christ, okay? Uh, so again, the Father even initiates the teaching about who Jesus is and uh, what they need to know. Then in John 6, 29, uh, it says that the work of God, this is in the context of the Bread of Life discussion, the work of God is that you believe 
and the one he sent. Okay, and so when God draws you and then God, God teaches you, uh, then what God wants you to do in response is to believe and to believe in Jesus, the one he sent. And then uh, going back to John 3, 16 again, all who believe in Christ uh, can receive eternal life. That's whoever, that's an anybody. That's not a Calvinist, only some. God selects who's going to believe or not. No, it says God lets anybody come to Christ. God teaches anyone who wants to know. Uh, and then God says anybody who believes can receive eternal life. And that's when uh, John 3, 5 comes back around. Uh, we're born of water and of the Spirit. That's also a work initiated by God. Uh, and then again, back to chapter 6, verses 37 and 39, whoever comes to Christ, he will not reject, and he will never lose them. In other words, if you make a decision to come to Jesus and you commit yourself to him, he's never going to lose you. He's not going to be the shepherd that lets one of the 99 or one of the 100 go off. Um, he is never going to lose you. And he says even um, that it's my father's will that I lose none of those whom he has given to me. And then you have uh, John 10. It says the sheep belong to God and to Christ, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. Uh, not the devil, not any of the devil's uh, demons or angels. Uh, no circumstance of life. You think of the end of Romans chapter 8. All the nothing that can separate us from God, uh, that applies to this passage as well. Once we are in Jesus, we are safe forever, and nothing can separate us from Jesus. Uh, the only way would be if we chose to walk away forever and we never came back. Uh, that would be the only way to be separated from Jesus. Uh, and then, uh, finally, in John 6, 40, Jesus says, whoever believes in Christ will be raised up in the last day. In other words, then we'll have eternal life. Now, uh, probably you've never read these passages in this order before, and obviously they jump around in the order of John. But what I've tried to do is take John's overall teaching about salvation and how one comes to Christ uh, overall in the book of John. And I've tried to organize it in that order to kind of show the process uh, by which comes to Christ and what may be the different steps. But these are all teachings that come straight out of John. I don't think by putting this order, it's any abuse of the context. Uh, it's all teaching about, look, you know, the one who is in charge of this process is God from start to finish. He begins it. He enables it. Uh, he makes it possible for us to respond. Uh, then when we respond, he saves us, he keeps us safe, and then we live with him forever. It's all God from start to finish. Uh, we are in the position of deciding to respond or not. Uh, so that's uh, a brief look at, at salvation in the Gospel of John. Now, as you look at this process, and especially thinking as one who's been a minister and a missionary before, uh, you think about, you know, what is our role then? <laughs> In this process, if God's in charge of it and God starts it and God carries it on and God, you know, foot brings it to completion, it's almost as if there's nothing left for us to do. Uh, and yet, if you go over to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, you see Paul talking about he and Apollos, that they're God's co-workers, that they plant and they water, but then God gives the increase. And you see chapter 9, you see that, you know, Paul does everything he can uh, to be able to make the gospel available and understandable to the people who are around him, no matter what their situation or nationality. And so you see that you know, we are involved. We do need to respond to God. And then as we share this, uh, then we do everything that we can to make the gospel available uh, and understandable to other people. Uh, but it remains the fact that we're not in charge. And so to me, that takes a lot of pressure off. Because uh, sometimes in the past when I've studied with people, studied the Bible, and they haven't really seemed to understand, or if they understand, sometimes they don't uh, want to obey. And I just think, you know, what else can I do? What else can I say? How else can I convince them uh, to become a Christian? Because I really think that's the best thing for them, and it's not happening. And it would be frustrating sometimes, or I'd feel guilty, like I wasn't doing it the right way, or I, if I just learned something more, or if I just, you know, did a little bit extra, 
that somehow that would do the trick. Uh, and this kind of a focus here in John uh, shows that it doesn't depend on me. Uh, it depends on God working through me and through the other person. Uh, and so this kind of lets me relax just a little bit. It doesn't mean I, I don't have anything to do. But what it does mean is that, that I can relax and say, God's in charge. He knows what's going on in this person's life. He knows what he wants me to do, and he'll show me that. Um, and, and it's in God's hands. And so when we pray about this process and other people, we don't necessarily pray. Now, you know, make them believe. Uh, we say, Lord, you know, this person is in your hands. Uh, the study time that I have with this person and what we study, what we talk about, the questions they're asked and how I answer, all that's in your hands. And so, Lord, just please direct this process however you want to. And that way, God is the one who gives the increase. Uh, I like that better. Uh, it seems less stressful uh, because it, it puts things in their proper perspective that God is really in charge. Um, also, in connection with this, um, let's kind of skip that. Sorry about that. Um, there's a book that I wanted to mention, and it's called So Also in Christ. It's just a short, easy-to-read book about salvation. Uh, but I like what the author says. He distinguishes between subjective and objective salvation. Uh, he says that uh, objective salvation is everything that God and Jesus did to make salvation possible. You know, God decided that he wanted to have a relationship with us. He prepares and sends Jesus to the world. Uh, he helps Jesus go through his ministry, doing what he wants. Jesus chooses to obey God in every way, lives a perfect life. Uh, Jesus dies on the cross, has a perfect sacrifice. He fulfills all the messianic prophecies. Uh, he is raised from the dead by God. And then he comes back to the disciples and gives them the mission of going out and sharing that gospel of what God has done and who God and Jesus are with the rest of the world. So that's the objective part. Uh, all of that is fact. All of that has already happened and nothing can change any of that. Uh, that's gonna be there and that's way for, for the rest of eternity. Uh, that's the objective part. But uh, there's also a subjective part of salvation where you and I, then we come and we see everything that God and Jesus have done. And we read the Bible and we study and we think about it. And we, we reflect on uh, what it would mean if we were to become Christians and commit ourselves to Jesus and to God and what the Christian life is like. And so then we decide whether or not we're going to accept the salvation that God and Jesus are offering. Their part doesn't ever change. It's always done and it's always available to us. Uh, but our part is our decision, and God's not going to force us to decide anything that we don't want to do. Now, once we commit ourselves to God, then he is our Lord, and we do need to obey and follow him. Uh, but in this step here, it's subjective in the sense that I can decide about what I believe and what I'm going to do. Another way to look at this, and this actually comes out of the same book uh, in uh, So Also in Christ, he talks about, suppose you have a house uh, that has all the doors shut and all the windows shut and all the curtains drawn. In fact, they're the kind of curtains that are blackout curtains. And so that if you're in the house, uh, then uh, even though it's the sunniest of days outside, the house is completely black inside with no lights turned on, whatever. And he said, uh, the objective salvation part would be that outside, it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining, it's a blue sky, the birds are singing, the grass and the trees and the flowers. It's a beautiful world outside the house. That's the objective part. This is the reality of what God has created in terms of the world and in terms of salvation. But inside the house, it's still dark and black and you can't see anything, you can't hear anything. Uh, it's as if the outer world did not exist because so far you haven't interacted with that world if you're inside the house. And uh, the author says, suppose then that you were to go and draw back the curtains and then light would flood into the house and yet still a lot of the house would be dark. Uh, and you look out the window and you see that world out there and you think, huh, I wonder what that is or I wonder what it'd be like to be out there, but you're not quite sure yet. 
Uh, and so there's light now in the house to a certain extent, but you're still inside the house. And then maybe you go and open other curtains and see what it's like out the other windows. And then you think, well, you know, what it'd be like if we opened the window? And so you open a window and you, you let in the fresh air and you, you feel the breeze and you hear some of the sounds from outside the house and, and the wind blowing through the trees and you think, wow, that's pretty impressive, but you're still inside the house. And then finally you decide, I want to go outside <laughs> and I want to experience uh, that life. And so you open the door finally and then more light comes in and the, the air of the house starts to be refreshed by the air outside the house. Uh, and you go outside into that world and now you've joined that world. And the author says this is the subjective part of salvation. It could be that salvation is available literally all around you but until you open yourself up and your mind and your heart, and then you choose to, just, to go out and join that world, uh, you're still without salvation. In that sense, it's subjective. And if you chose, you could remain in the dark house forever and not know about or experience the salvation, that world outside the house. Uh, but if you choose, then you can leave the house, leave the dark, uh, and go into the world. Uh, so I thought that was a great example uh, to use to describe what happens uh, when God comes to the world through Jesus and he says, here is my will uh, for you. Here is the relationship I want to have. Here is how you go about coming into a relationship with me. And that's what we talked about uh, today in the Gospel of John. Hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.